it's Caleb's fault. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to FBC this morning. Would you please stand and praise our God with us today?
may be seated. Welcome to First Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We are excited to worship together. The battle does belong to the Lord. I'm not sure what battle you're in right now, but we praise God for his goodness to us and for his strength, uh, his grace to us, even in the midst of a difficult time. We thank you for joining us this morning. We have a, a good day planned for us this morning. Uh, we have a, a, a members meeting coming up. We have a meal coming up. I'd like to publicly thank Amy Trader and her team. She's got a large team of people. Yes, let's give her thanks. And let's thank God for her uh, last week, Easter breakfast, this week, members meal. Uh, she's had a lot to do, and we're going to give her a break hopefully after this, but we're thankful for her and her leadership in there and all the people that have helped prepare those meals for us. Join us for that afterwards. You don't have to be a member to join us. We even have some kind of fun things to do at our tables this week, so uh, looking forward to that. Um, Another thing that, uh, that's coming up on May 8th is, uh, is a Bible study that we're going to have in 201 called Interpreting Galatians. And I, I want you to understand this is a two, the, the goal for this Bible study is twofold. First of all, we're, we're going to study a book of the Bible that's first and foremost what we're doing here, <laughs> to hear from God, from his word. But I want to encourage you, if you've not, um, maybe you're feeling, uh, I don't know, uh, it, I need to get more out of my Bible, Bible study, or maybe you're looking for uh, help in interpreting Scripture. I want, you, I want to encourage everyone, you are interpreters. You're good interpreters. We do this every day. We hear people talk, we, we read things, and we interpret what the meaning is, and uh, we can do that with God's Word, and His Word can, uh, we can unlock the meaning of that. And I want to share with this Bible study ways to do that, some helpful tips. Um, one of the things we're going to do, we're going to give everyone one of these. It's called a Scripture Journal. Um, and it's the book of Galatians, but on one side it's got the scripture, on the other side it's got some open area to write. And so we're going to go together through the book of Galatians, you, learning some principles of interpretation and, uh, and working together through that. So let me encourage you to join us for that. That's during the 9 o'clock hour, starting on May 8th, so ne not next week, but the week after that. Uh, and if you have any questions or whatever, if you'd like to, to sign up, uh, that we don't have a sign-up sheet, but let me know. Uh, you don't need to sign up to come to this, but um, I've, got, I've bought some of these already. I may have to buy more. That's okay. So, uh, final announcement here is from our BLAST team. We have a VBS coming up in June, June 27th, and they've prepared a quick video to, uh, to share with you some of the needs regarding that. So, let's watch that. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the song sets free, always oh, free indeed. I'm a child. A slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who the sun sets free, always oh, free in me. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. There's a place for 
All right. So I am already excited for VBS. Nikki Corberly is planning this. She's doing a great job already. Uh, but they, we need uh, some help with this. It's a big task. The fr I, I don't know if you caught it, but the number one thing we need your help with is praying. Please begin to pray that God would work in the hearts of children who are here in, in our hearts, who are helping uh, and volunteering that week as a church family. Uh, we need, this is a wonderful opportunity uh, to show the love of Christ. So begin praying now. It's on June 27th, um, but also consider helping out. You do not have to be uh, an amazing, you know, uh, uh, creative children's worker in order to help with VBS. You just need to love people. That's really it. So uh, let me encourage you to join and help us. Get a hold of Nikki. Her information was there. If you need help with that, we can help you with that. Just let the office know. We can connect you with her. Um, but we'd love to be able to work together uh, to share the gospel with, uh, with the young folks of this church and of this community. So uh, mark your calendars. Be praying about that. And, uh, and with that, why don't we open our service this morning, and let's pray specifically for our VBS as we look forward to, to doing that. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity that you have given to us by placing us here in this community, uh, in this church, to share the wonderful news of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, the gospel with so many children. We pray, Lord, that this would would bear fruit in their hearts, that some would be saved, that we would make contacts with their families, and that we would go from, from this VBS rejoicing, praising you for what you have done through your servants. And I pray that you would add servants to this, that we together, collectively as a church, would come together for this opportunity. What a wonderful chance that we have to serve our risen Savior together. And we pray now for this service. Draw our hearts to you, Lord. Help us to open our eyes to the Scripture, that we would see Jesus in the pages of Scripture, that we would, we would not see the trouble or the difficulty that we may have. We would not see the successes or wins that we may have had this week, that we would put aside what, what is true about us and look to be what's true about you, Lord. We pray that you would give to us a measure of your spirit this morning as we consider these things. Help us to grow personally in our hearts. Help us to grow together as a church body. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and worship with us again. Sing this out if you know it.
This next song that we're going to sing uh, ties directly into 2 Timothy 1. Actually, there's a quote straight from it, but I'm going to read a couple uh, verses around that as well, just so you can get some context, um, starting in verse 6. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel of the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed to a preacher and apostle and teacher which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. We may not fully understand what God is doing through our day-to-day -day activities or uh, through rough times or even good times, but 
as we've already sung in the other songs we've sung how he's the ancient of days uh, he's already gone before us and the victory's already won and in his hands and if we if we believe that we can trust in him and and just like the verse says for i know whom i have believed and i'm convinced that he's able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me despite our failings in the face of struggles he will continue to hold us fast so i challenge you as we sing this next song let this be a proclamation of your heart and declaring about whom you have believed in as well God's people said, Amen. Heavenly Father, we're humbled by your faithfulness. Father, we're, we're, we just, as we stand in your presence here this morning, we, we just recognize your love, your faithfulness, that we can look to you, we can trust you, that even though or when we go through the challenges of this life, that you watch over us, you protect us, you're sovereign. You're in control of all things. Nothing will happen to us that without th this day without passing through your hands. And so, Father, I thank you that that, that, that is an evidence of your love. And because you love, we in turn love you. And as a result of your love, we then love one another. So I pray that you would go before us now in our time together. I pray that... Every heart would, would look to you, would turn to you, would be comforted in you, be strengthened, to be motivated to live for you. And Father, I pray that through all of this, you would be glorified. You are worthy of all praise and honor, and we thank you for all of these things. We ask them in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> <clears throat> an individual had a dream and shares the account of this dream. He says, I dreamed that I was in heaven and was standing with many folks who had trusted the Lord for salvation. We were worshiping the Lord with exuberance. I struck up a conversation with the man next to me. We all speak the same language in heaven. And he told me that he was a Roman Christian 
and had been in heaven for about 1,900 years. He had died in Nero's persecutions, covered with pitch and set on fire to light Nero's gardens. How awful, I replied. The Roman Christian responded, by no means. I count it a privilege to have suffered for Christ. He died on the cross for me. The man on the other side spoke. I've only been in heaven for a few hundred years. I come from an island in the South Seas. A missionary by the name of John Williams came and told me about Jesus, and I too came to salvation. My fellow countrymen killed the missionary, and they caught and bound me. I was beaten until I fainted, and they thought that I was dead. But I revived, and the next day, they knocked me on the head, cooked me, and ate me. How terrible, I said. No, he answered, I was glad to die as a Christian. You see, the missionaries had told me that Jesus was scourged and crowned with the thorns and died on the cross for me. They both turned to me and said, what did you suffer for him? Or did you sell what you had so that you could give to the missionaries like John Williams and so that he could tell people like us about the Lord Jesus Christ? I was speechless. And as they both looked at me with pleading eyes, I awoke. It was a dream. But I lay on my soft bed wondering if I had really done all that I could for the cause of Christ and the message of salvation to a lost and dying world. The words of Jesus out of Mark 8, 34, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, took on a whole new meaning. Now, that may have been a dream, but it ought to cause all of us to contemplate what we have done for Christ or what we could do for Christ. And 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now, that, that drives me to ask myself, Am I persecuted? Have I been persecuted for the cause of Christ? Could I do more for the cause of Christ? Not to seek out persecution, but if I'm doing all that I could do for the cause of Christ, then scripture here says we will be persecuted in some way, at some time, to some extent. If you're not already there, turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. We are actually moving through. We're at the end of chapter one, Philippians 1, we're going to be looking at verses 27 to 30. But let me remind you of the context. It's been a, a few weeks now. Remember, Paul was in prison because of Christ, because of his testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. He was being persecuted, and he was not sure that he would survive. In fact, in verse 21, he says, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Verse 23, the end of verse 23 says, My desire is to depart and to be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is far more, necess is, is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Today's text, verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for your sake, excuse me, that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same affliction that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. <clears throat> Paul's prayer, Paul's hope, was to hear that the Philippians were standing firm for the faith of the gospel. So here's your take-home thought today. And that is, faith in the gospel produces spiritual strength to endure. 
Faith in the gospel produces spiritual strength so that you are able to endure. The gospel provides strength because the gospel is based upon the salvation that only Jesus provides for those who would believe. Last Sunday was Easter, right? Resurrection Sunday. <clears throat> and it's all, and, and, and uh, the Easter, the, the Resurrection Sunday is all about the gospel, which provides the grace for being justified. That's our salvation. The moment of salvation, you're justified through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But also the grace for sanctification, to be sanctified, to grow in your faith, to become more like the Lord Jesus Christ, to become strong in your faith. So don't give up on Jesus when your faith is challenged. And it will be challenged, right? Stand firm in your faith when you are experiencing the difficulties of this life. Now, the gospel, your salvation enables you to stand strong in the face of those difficulties. And in this, con uh, in this context, the difficulties were persecutions. And that's the most direct application of this text. He's talking about persecution. Persecution is difficulty that you face because of your faith. People find out that you're a Christian, whether it's by observing your life at, or, uh, or hearing your testimony or hearing the gospel from you. They find out you're a Christian and they may not like it and so they persecute you. They, 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 they ridicule you. They mock you. They put you down in, and, and maybe even physically abuse you because you are a Jesus follower. So this morning we want to look at three expressions of spiritual strength, three expressions of standing firm under persecution. And again, when you think of persecution today, there are, there are testimonies of actual persecution. You, you, you just look, just go to Google and type in persecution of Christians or martyrdom for Christians. And there are Current examples, I've, I came across this one, actually took place um, uh, on March 8th of this year. A Ugandan family was reportedly attacked with acid sprayed on them for leaving Islam to embrace Christianity. According to Mo Morning Star News, an outlet monitoring Christian persecution across the globe. Juma Waiswa age 38, his wife Nasimu Nagaga, age 32, and the couple's daughter Amina Nagudi, age 13, were reportedly attacked on March 8th after refusing to deny their newfound faith in Christ. Just this last month, March 8th, physically persecuted for their faith. You may face persecutions at work, because you're asked to do something that would be unethical or immoral, and you say, I can't do it because of my faith. And you may be ridiculed. You may, you may suffer uh, repercussions. You may even lose your job. That, that happens in our culture, in the United States of America today. You may stand up to your classmates or family friend, a family member or a friend giving your testimony and they may mock you, they may ridicule you, they may just say they don't want anything more to do with you. There are forms of persecution that we face even here today. You may be canceled because of your testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't want to hear what you have to say. So we will cancel you. So here's the first expression of spiritual strength, and that's your conduct. The first expression of your spiritual strength in the face of difficulties and persecution is, is your conduct, how you live, how you live out your, your faith. Look at verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Again, the context of these verses shows you that Paul is saying, whatever happens, 
whether Paul dies as a result of testifying before Nero, and that was a great possibility of happening, or whether he remains alive and, and is released or even remains in prison. He says, let your manner of life, your conduct, the King James uses the word conversation, meaning the way in which you act. And it was a term of citizenship or behavior as a citizen, which would have been very picturesque for, uh, in the Greek language as the Philippians identified with the phrase because they were citizens of Rome. They were citizens. Let your, let your conduct as a citizen of heaven indicate that you are a child of God. A couple thoughts. If you're saved, you are already a citizen of heaven. You don't have to work to become a citizen of heaven. If, if you've placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for your eternal salvation, that we, we dealt with this more extensively last week, but that involves the repentance from sin and coming to salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ, who, as we again discussed last week, died on the cross, was buried, and rose again. You believe that he did that on your behalf for you, and you ask him to save you. That's salvation, right? And if you have done that, you are a citizen of heaven. Now, let me tell you this. A lot of talk about illegal immigration today, right? There's no, no one can illegally immigrate into heaven. <laughs> All right? You can't, can't do it. There, there's no illegal immigration. However, all citizenship into heaven is immigration, okay? There's no one who is born a citizen of heaven. Now, this goes for all of us, but as a child, you are not getting into heaven on the, on the coattails of your parents or your grandparents, okay? Just because your parents insisted on you going to church doesn't mean you're going to make it into heaven. Your faith must be your faith, not the faith of somebody else's. Our, our prayer for our children as they were growing up was that our God would be their God. And, and that's essential for you. you. You can't hope that just because your parents were godly that, that you will be godly. It must become your faith as a matter of immigration, so to speak, to become a citizen of heaven, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that you might be saved. You must go through immigration <laughs> by receiving Jesus and becoming a citizen of heaven. Now, here's another thought. If you're a citizen of heaven, you must behave as such. If you're a citizen of heaven, it, it ought to be evident. For example, if you become a citizen of the United States upon immigration, you pledge allegiance to this great country. You take on an oath that says, Amen. in essence, that you will live at a, as a citizen ought to live. And you take an oath and it goes like this. I'm not going to read it in its entirety, but it says, I hereby declare on oath that I absolutely and entirely renounce and abjure all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince, potentate, state, or sovereignty of whom or which I have hereto, heretofore been a subject or citizen, that I will support and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, so help me God, in an acknowledgement whereof I have hereunto affixed my signature. If, if you immigrate and you become a citizen of the United States, you are saying, I pledge allegiance to this great country, right? And I am therefore going to live like a citizen of this country. That's the way it is as a citizen of heaven. <laughs> we pledge allegiance to the Lamb of God. And when, when you do that, 
He desires you. He expects you. It ought to be true that you are living as a citizen of his kingdom. Live what you profess. That's your responsibility, of course, with his help and his enablement. And the Philippians were, con were to conduct themselves, according to this passage, as citizens of heaven, even though they were here on this earth. Their conduct, the conduct of the believer, is to be appropriate to his or her profession. If you profess to know the Lord Jesus Christ, to profess to be a citizen of heaven, it ought to be evident. That's what Paul's saying here. If you profess to be a gospel believer, a, a Jesus follower, your behavior is going to match that way of life. The phrase here in verse 27, look at verse 27, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel takes into account a total life experience. It's not just, I'm going to go to church on Sundays for that hour and a half or two hours, whatever it is, and that's, that's sufficient to, to be evidence of my Christianity, and then the rest of the week I'll do and live the way I well please. No. It, it takes in the total life experience. Your life might, must line up with the Word of God to be consistent with God's Word in speech, in the way that you live, in dealing with others, your walk in the church as well as outside the church. And you live the life. You don't just say that you do, but you live it. It's interesting, the, 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 the phrase there, worthy of the gospel, that my life would be worthy of the gospel. That means that your life carries the weight of the gospel, to have like value of the gospel. Think of the value of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oftentimes, my, my wife will pray that individuals would experience the heart-changing, life-transforming work of the gospel in their lives. That, that's what we're talking about here, that your life would, would carry the weight, would be evidence of the weight of the gospel to be consistent with the message. The gospel is a message of grace. You don't deserve salvation. You don't deserve the grace of God. So you live a life of holiness out of a spirit of gratefulness. Why? Because God is holy. And as you recognize the holiness of God and you rec realize all that he's done for you by his great salvation, you say, God, thank you. And I therefore, as I will therefore take to heart the, the, the command to be holy because you are holy. If you say you, that you're a member of a soccer team or a baseball team or a football team, whatever team, but you never show up for practice, or you don't even show up for the game, then there would be reason to doubt whether you are really a member of that team, right? But if you're a member of a team, you're going to do as the coach says to do. And so, Christians, you must obviously do what God desires you to do, to, to put into practice the word of God out of a grateful heart by the power of the Spirit working in you and reliance upon Him. But if you don't or are not willing to do that, you have reason to doubt whether you're really a Christian or not. To realize that you're delivered from the power of sin, then live like it. And that's proof of standing firm. Your, your conduct is going to be evidence or an expression of spiritual strength. Especially when you face difficulties of persecution. Here's another expression of that, and that's your companionships. Your companionships. Only let your conduct, verse 27, your manner of life, be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm... In one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Paul refers to the possibility of his release 
and seeing them or hearing about their conduct, which encourages standing firm in unity. This has the idea of holding fast to a position, holding the line in the face of a difficulty or when challenged, persevering in this context. The position upon which we stand is faith in the gospel. Not one's opinion, not preferences. Now this is the first reference to contention at the church at Philippi. There was, there was some contention going on. He's going to get a little more specific about that later on in chapter 4. We'll get to that. But he's, 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 he's indicating there was contention at the church at, Eph or at Philippi. Excuse me. So there was contention then. And I, was, I say there's contention now. And there's contention even here at FBC. It's not easy for a pastor to say that. We're experiencing some disunity here at FBC. It needs to be addressed, and we're planning to address that. We're going to give some direction in today's members' meeting concerning how to go about that. But the encouragement is that God desires unity. And this church, or any church, is going to have all kinds of opinions. We're going to have all kinds of preferences. But God desires, based on what we even have here in this text, God desires unity around the gospel of Jesus Christ. Unity around Jesus and his message and the message of salvation. Here's a couple thoughts. In light of the context here, unity is essential to facing opposition. Or if we could say, persecution. And, and, and the church is going to face that more and more. The church has faced it all through history. We have lived in relative ease here at, in the United States, I believe. But we're seeing it just kind of bubbling up more and more, aren't we? Just by the illustrations that I've uh, mentioned earlier. Paul here is addressing unity in the corporate stent. Back up just a second. This should be taken to heart personally. Okay? We need, to, we need to say, we need to, you need to say, I need to stand, <laughs> right? That's a personal thing. In this context, however, he's talking about a corporate sense as well. This is taken to your heart, you stand firm. However, Paul is addressing unity in a corporate sense of standing firm. Look at, the, look at the text. He says, standing firm in one spirit, this indicates unity. This indicates being one in our spirits because of the Holy Spirit. So he's talking about a spiritual oneness. He's, he's not talking about all of the other things over which we may disagree. He's talking about a spiritual oneness that we may, we may be one in spirit with one mind. That has to do with our thinking, but the phrase literally has to do with breathing, with one breath. Interesting. It has to do with our speech. Our thinking and our expressions are focused on similar things, and those similar things are Jesus and the gospel. We say the same things about Jesus. That is, Jesus is God, the Son from eternity past, born of a virgin, sinless, holy, without blemish, that he lived a life without blemish, that he was mocked and beaten, scourged, persecuted, placed on the cross, died, was buried, and rose again to provide salvation. So he is our Savior he is our Lord. And that is, those are the things around which we unify as a people of God. The gospel and our Lord Jesus Christ with one mind, striving side by side. Again, they're in the text. Literally mean, it means to wrestle in company with. <laughs> yeah, I mentioned last week I was a wrestler, right? Man, there was more than once I wished that when I was wrestling 
on that mat that I had a, about three or four other guys to help me, right? When it comes to the persecution, when it comes to the difficulties and the challenges, how important it is for us to know and believe that there are others around us to help us. Think of Elijah, you know, when he's, oh, it's a, you know, it's a, I'm the only one. And God says, open your eyes. There's 7,000 others who have not bowed their, their, their knees to the, the idols, to Baal. You know, wow. You know, there are many others. And how encouraging that is that, that we wrestle in company with striving side by side for the gospel, for the same thing, that we're working together for the same thing, and that's the, the perpetuation of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. To make Jesus and his great salvation known. That's why we're here. That's what we want to accomplish in and through the ministry of our church and ministry. Ephesians chapter 4, just keep your finger here in Philippians, but you may take a look at Ephesians 4. Familiar passage when it comes to unity. Verses 1 to 3, Ephesians 4, 1 to 3. I'll give you a moment. Paul again writing, and he says, I therefore, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. There's that conduct, right? That's the conduct, once again. <clears throat> that you walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Listen, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. In Jesus, by the power of his spirit, there is unity in Jesus Christ because we're children of God and we're members of his body together. There is unity. We ought to be there then eager, which has the idea of being willing to make effort and be earnest and give diligent labor to maintain to guard it, to hold it, fa hold fast unity. That's what we ought to be about. Eager to maintain that. And the, and the, the world is, the world's looking for that kind of unity. The world likes to seek unity by everybody agreeing. The world's message used to be that of tolerance. Oh, you know, you Christians, you need to tolerate different views. But now, since the world has gained an ear, right, these, these issues have come up and people are, are like, oh, you know, we've, we've got we've to be tolerant, we've got to listen to them, we've got to allow them to have their views. Now, if we have a different view as Christians, we're canceled. We don't like your view. We're not, you had to be tolerant of us until we got became greater than you, and now we don't have to be tolerant of you. We're going to cancel you. You're not allowed a voice if you don't agree. But our unity, the unity of the church, is for the faith of the gospel. Back to Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. It's for, because of, the faith of the gospel and because of our desire to see the gospel perpetuated. Not personal agendas, but Paul challenged them to conduct themselves in like fashion as a member on a team, to strive side by side. Again, another athletic term. To work in sync together. In football, uh, if a play breaks down, a commentator will often say, so and so missed their assignment. Right? They, they missed their assignment. The play broke down. And if you keep that up, you're going to lose the game. Now, if the coach says, okay, here's the play. We're going to run it to the right. And half of the team says, no, there are big guys on the right. We're going to run it to the left. So you have half the team going one way and half the team going the other way. The play is certainly going to break down and, and it will not be effective 
in the church, we strive together. We work together for the perpetuation of the Gospels to make disciples of every nation. Everyone participates in various ways, doing his or her part to accomplish that. By way of illustration, we just, we just look at as what's happening today. I just think of, of what it took for, for this service to be accomplished, to, 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 to draw our hearts before the Lord in worship. We had our, our, our sound AV team came in here, set, made sure microphones were set up, working, and, and all. The, the praise team came in early, and they, they went through the service, and, and, and the instrumentalists made sure their instruments were tuned properly, and the vocalists made sure that their voices were tuned properly, however you do that. <clears throat> and uh, so they, 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 everybody works together, and, and then it even goes before that because there was planning that went into it, and there were rehearsals that went into that. I mean, again, everybody that had a part did their part to draw you and me into worship of our great God. See? We're going to have, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we're going to have a meal. The, the meal team planned the meal, and Amy got the team together. They were here Friday. They... they cracked 12 dozen eggs. They boiled and cracked 12 dozen eggs for, for lunch today. 140, could you imagine? They, 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 I don't know if they even like eggs now, but they were willing to do that, and, and they, you know, they were in there, they're chopping things, and I walked in, hey, how's it going? And, and uh, oh, you know, and <laughs> we're getting it done, you know, and they, they had a great time doing it. Amy, I talked to her this morning, she was so thankful for the team. She says, I got a great team. And so some people plan, some people prepare, some people um, are going to clean up. God provides the increase, right? <laughs> We're going to enjoy that because there was a team that pulled together to do that and to minister to the body. But in the same way, we have a connections team where they meet every Wednesday and they go through the congregation and they think, all right, who, who has a need? Who needs a call? Who needs a visit? How are we going to accomplish this? And, and then encouraging all of us to do our part in, in those kinds of things and, and just the whole idea of reaching out into the community. How are we doing that? What are you doing to be a part of that? Vacation Bible School. You know, we need, we need volunteers to get involved in Vacation Bible School. And again, as they said, if, if you can't literally be a volunteer to help with the children, pray. We can pray. We all do our part to accomplish that. It's a tremendous outreach into the community. Think of our laundry ministry. Think of our ladies' ministries. Just think of what it takes for this ministry to continue. We have pastors. We have deacons. We praise the Lord for their faithfulness. In, in their ministry, we have ministry teams, major ministry teams. We have worship. We have operations. And we have discipleship and outreach. You're going to hear reports from those during our, our members' meeting here in just a little bit. Just to, so you know what's going on. And, and they coordinate the rest of the congregation to volunteer and to do their part in accomplishing the work of the ministry. We have secretaries. We have uh, other support staff. We have Bible study teachers. We have life group leaders, children and youth leaders. It takes all of us doing our parts. But not only that, to do your part to influence your world, whatever your world looks like. Family and friends and classmates and coworkers, neighbors, to influence and have an impact on this world for Christ. We all do our part, and when we do that, nothing can hold us back. You know, this is this is Christ's church. It's God's church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against her. And so we need to be unified. If we're not unified, we can't stand effectively against the opposition of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Another thought on this point is unity depends upon you. 
We can't say, oh, I just, I wish, just wish that church would get their act together and be unified. It starts with you, right? We, we all need to do our part in unifying around the gospel. How do, how do you do that? You personally be committed to the gospel, right? And, and living out the gospel in your conduct. And to be telling others of the gospel, to do your part in that, to play your role in the communication and perpetuation of the gospel. And as you do that, and we do that together, locking arms to, for that, that united front for the cause of Jesus Christ, then we see companionships grow. And we literally reach our world, the community of Troy and the world around us for the sake of the gospel. And there's no limit to what we could do and will do. So we have <clears throat> our conduct, our companionship. But another expression of spiritual strength is your courage. Expression of spiritual strength in the face of persecution, difficulties is your courage. The end of verse 27. I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. The word being not frightened there, the phrase there, means don't be startled like a frightened horse. I don't know if you've ever worked with horses. When they get around the unfamiliar, they could get pretty skittish, right? I, I worked with horses when I worked at camp years ago. And, uh, and they, they just they get around the unfamiliar, and, and they, you point this particular horse, you point it its nose toward the barn, and you better just hang on. I mean, it was like, this, this party here is over. I'm heading back to that which is comfortable. This has the idea of being willing to break out of your comfort zone. It, it, let's, let's be honest, right? It, it's not easy to, for most of us to say, hey, I, I want to tell you about Jesus, <laughs> you know? How do, you, how do you get to that? There's some things we can learn on how to do that and do that effectively, right? It's, it's not always easy. And, and even for those who have done it for years, sometimes it's just, okay, I, I, just need to, I just need to break out of my comfort zone and start talking to people about Jesus. He encourages here, don't be frightened by that. Take, take it to heart. And, and be willing to Reach out to others, to in, invite others to church. Just If you're not in the habit of sharing your testimony, the gospel, just say, hey, why don't you come to my church? You know, you're going through some challenges, difficulties, or hey, I'll tell you what, we're just having a great time over there at FBC, and we'd, I'd love for you to come to church, hear our pastor preach. Just start with that. Give people your testimony. You know, be ready to give a, a, a defense, a reason for the hope of the gospel in you. Telling others your testimony. Don't be intimidated by your persecutors. I think we're being intimidated in our culture right now to the point of don't say anything. So I think a lot of Christians right now are just being content to live it out, which we, we just heard that you need to do that, right? Live out the gospel. Let your conduct speak for you. But, but I think it has gotten to the point where we, we just figure I just, that, that's going to be good enough. I think we need to be encouraged. And I want to encourage you to start talking to people about the gospel. Not just, not just living it. We, we need to live it. But part of that living it is sharing that message of hope and salvation through Jesus Christ. Speaking it. Take courage to do that. A couple thoughts. Courage is the result of your salvation. That you're not frightened, verse 28, in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign 
to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. When persecutors fail to intimidate and see your boldness, they may be convicted of their sinfulness. So courage is a result of your salvation. Another thought, courage grows through proper perspective. Courage increases. Well, let me read the verse, verse 29. Courage grows through proper perspective. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Courage increases in proportion to understanding that it is your privilege to suffer for Jesus. Did you ever think about that? It, he has counted it a privilege for you to suffer for him. We need to gain that perspective. So we not only believe him for our eternal salvation, but that faith produces strength to suffer on his behalf. Jesus was unjustly accused. So are you willing to suffer for him? A final thought. <laughs> Courage loves company. <laughs> Courage loves company. Verse 30, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I have. The persecution was a result of preaching Christ and him, him crucified. Who else was doing that? Paul. Other believers in the church were doing that. And if they can do it, I can do it too. Right? Right? I mean, it's just, it, it, it's an encouragement when you know that others are in this with you. Be faithful at preaching, at teaching, at sharing the witnessing and sharing the gospel. Let's do it together as a church. All of us together accomplishing the, 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 the goal, the, accomplishing the mandate of making disciples of the, the whole world. If, if, if the rest, if all the other Christians had the same attitude toward their faith as you do, how many other people would hear the gospel? <laughs> right? How many other people would be, if everybody had the same idea about your Christ, Christian faith as you do, how many other people would hear about that or know about that? Just a thought. The, the encouragement is, you know what? I, I need to step it up, right? That, that we all need to. Nobody's arrived on this. But as we do that and we take steps and we hear testimonies to that end, we're encouraged, right? You hear somebody who's, who's I just saw Ron there, someone who's down at the laundry ministry, and, and there are people who are involved in that laundry ministry that were like, mm, I don't know, I've never done this before, but I'm going to do it. And they see the likes of Ron Poling out there, you know, hey, you know, <laughs> and uh, all excited about his walk with the Lord, and you see someone like that, it's like, yeah, I can do that. Or Ron, help me to be more effective in doing that. See, we, we do this together. The godly will be persecuted. But with God's help, we can stand firm. In Rome, it was said that Christians were haters of humanity. Someone forwarded this to me just, this, just the other day. It comes from a website called eyewitnesshistory.com. The following account was written by Roman historian Tacitus in his book, Annals, published a few years after the event. Tacitus was a young boy living in Rome during the time of the persecution, and he writes, Emperor Nero falsely charged with guilt and punished with the most fearful tortures the persons commonly called Christians. Accordingly, first those who... Accordingly, First, those were arrested who confessed they were Christians. Next, on their information, a vast multitude were convicted, not so much on the charge of burning the city as of hating the human race. That was the charge against them, that they hated the human race. 
In their very deaths, they were made the subject of sport. They were covered with the hides of wild beasts and worried to death by dogs or nailed to crosses or set fire to and when the day waned, burned to serve for the evening lights. Today, this is happening in our culture right now in that we are told that if we don't accept someone's lifestyle, we hate them. I thought you were a Christian and that you loved everybody. They don't understand that the most loving thing that we can do is to call people to repentance from sin. That which, that which God calls sin must be called sin because we all need to realize that we're sinners and we need a Savior in Jesus Christ, Right? That's the most loving thing we can do. But they're trying, to, they're trying to redefine love and redefine hate, right? They're trying to say that because we are willing to call out sin and sinful lifestyles, that we hate them. No, we don't hate them. We love them enough to say, don't go that way. Repent and come to salvation through Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave, he sacrificed his one and only son, that if you believe in him, you would not perish but have everlasting life. That's the message. And yet that message, there are many who want to cancel that message. But we can't be fearful. We can't be surprised by that handle it by loving others by continually proclaiming the gospel the gospel gives strength by the power of God and around which we must stand firm in the face of difficulty in the face of persecutions to the extent that our conduct is impacted that our companionships are essential and our courage is undeniable we're going to pray in just a moment but as we go to prayer, I'm just encouraging you to pray with me about this, asking God to help you bring your conduct in line with his holiness and the truth of the gospel, that unity would be your priority in the time of upheaval, however that may look in your life, that your courage to stand firm in the gospel would impact your life and the world around you, and that your faith in the gospel would produce a spiritual strength in you so that you will stand. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, these things we pray, and we ask that you would cause our hearts to live out the gospel, to live in light of our citizenship in heaven. That it would be genuine. It wouldn't be forced or, or coerced, but it would be just a natural outflow of our faith and that others would see you and us. And that starts in our hearts, but as we, as a, as a congregation, as a people of God, as we, as we recognize that, we pull together and the world looks at us and says, wow, those people love God and they love one another and they're unified for the cause of the gospel. May that be evident even here at First Baptist Church. And Father, that, that then would cause courage to rise up within us, to cause us to stand firm in the faith of the gospel. And Father, I pray that we would see you do that heart-changing, life-transforming work in our lives but in the lives of others around us because we're faithful to share the gospel, to do our parts. And I thank you for so many who are, who are, who are plugged in, who are, who are focusing on, the, on, on those things and, and doing their part to perpetuate the gospel. May we all be faithful to do that to your glory. Help us. And we thank you. And I pray that we, as we make these commitments in our hearts that it would make a difference. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
just take a moment here. Just encourage everyone to fill out a connection card. I'd like to hear about your commitment, your prayers, your testimonies. I encourage everyone to fill out a, a, a connection card there. And uh, thank you for your faithful giving. I look forward to our members meeting here in just a little bit. As we said, there's some things planned for that, for the, for the meal and then the members meeting. So I encourage everyone to, to take part in that. And uh, let's close as we sing. Please stand with us and sing.
world, we know that serving you is by no means an end to suffering in this life. In fact, your words tell us it's the complete opposite, where we will have persecution, and that is to be expected. But as your church prayed in Acts, let us also pray now to look upon their threats and grant your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. Give us discernment, wisdom, and boldness to listen to you rather than man. For we too were once in opposition to you, Lord. Yet through your working and your grace, you brought others, for most of us here, to witness to us so that we too might come and turn to you. So let your convictions upon our hearts produce fruit. Work through us both corporately and personally to refine us in the areas that need refined and help us to show love, your love, to all those who cross our paths. In your name we pray.